class. Please be quiet. Shh. Any special message for all the kids watching at home? Stay out of trouble. Welcome to the RPG Academy Network presents Film Studies. Welcome classroom, I am Kalum and I will be your teacher of film studies. Today we're going to review Delicatessen, a French movie from 1991, directed by Jean-Pierre Genet and Marc Caro. And today the faculty staff joining me includes... Howdy all you kids out there on Radio Land, I play... Dylan Brownfeet from Lawful and Orderly, and I'm also a regular contributor to the RPG Academy Actual Place, and I'm dang glad to be here. What type of teacher do you think you would be? A geography teacher. And we are also joined by Bianca. So it's nice to meet you. I do play Maypree in the Broadswords. It's a D&D 5e podcast. There's just four of us women, and we play it with like a bit of a feminist edge to it without being too in your face. Mepri, that's a French word or oh, appropriate today. It is, yes. So I like how things kind of link up. Content warning. The movie itself got some graphic violence as well as some somewhat explicit sexual content. Viewer discretion is advised. Exactly. <laughs> and this episode itself, uh, my content, some explicit language because... We are in a rush and we won't bleep out everything. Thank you for your understanding. You have been warned. So, Bianca. Yes. A tradition of film studies is to come up with a one sentence review slash tagline for the movie as well as a five stars rating. So what would be yours? I would absolutely give it a five star rating. I really enjoyed it. It wasn't what I expected, but it it handled everything that I didn't expect really well. So if I could summarize it in kind of one simple sentence, I would say it is a dark film with cannibalism, suicide attempts, murder, and an apocalyptic setting that manages to create crazy characters in an already crazy world. I will try to fit that on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> Long sentence. Scott, what about you? I would give Delicatessen a four out of five stars, or if we're allowing half star ratings, a four and a half out of five stars. And I think my tagline would be, much like Super Mario Brothers, when in doubt, pipes lead you out. Nice, excellent. So my own uh, single line would be a most savory story with a sweet conclusion. And I would give it five stars. I think it's uh, one of my all-time favorite movies. I mean, I, I don't want, especially after Clue, everybody gave five stars to Clue, so I'm giving five stars to Delicatessen. and come on. I mean, usually I'm like, yeah, you know, five stars is more 2001 A Space Odyssey or really, really up there or something. Delicatessen is a, is a five star. Well, I'm very happy you seem to have enjoyed the movie. I was a, I was a bit concerned uh, about that. Okay. Well, time for. A little summary of that movie. Spoiler alert for people who didn't watch it. The film opens with a dilapidated Parisian apartment building. The last one seemingly occupied amid a destroyed area. Light from its ground floor spills over the dusty foggy street. We enter the delicatessen butcher shop where someone is dutifully sharpening his knives. Cut to a man covered with trash, who barely managed to fit in a garbage bin. Turns out he's trying to take advantage of the morning waste collection to escape that place. Alas, the only escape for him this morning will be as a neatly packaged roast or a few sausages. <laughs> the butcher, Monsieur Clapet, played by Jean-Claude Dreyfus, is also the landlord of the old building, which is populated by a quirky ensemble of tenants. A working class family with children and an old mother-in-law, a old bourgeoisie couple, two co-box manufacturing brothers, a lady using her charms to survive, and even a snail-eating old legionnaire living in its flooded basement among frogs. Except the latter, they all rely on the butcher's bloody business to survive, which he accomplishes at a high price. A high price nowadays paid with lentils, corn, and other grains. 
Following the quotation mark departure of the last worker, the unemployed circus clone Rison, played by Dominique Pinon, shows up to fill the vacant position as advertised in the newspaper Hard Times. Unknown to him, he is expected to also later fill the butcher's larder. The butcher is reluctant to off him too quickly. He wants Rison to build up some muscles, and there are many repair jobs to perform in the building. Rison proves to be a superb worker. He also performs a number of tricks to entertain children and a few friendly tenants. This includes a spectacular trick knife, the Australian, which is like a boomerang knife which returns to its skilled drawer. During his routine maintenance, he befriends Clapet's daughter, Julie, played by Marie-Laure Dugnac, a relationship which slowly blossoms into romance. It doesn't take long for the less sympathetic tenants to get anxious for their own safety as everyone's bellies are getting emptier by the day. Aware of her father's motives, Julie descends into the sewers to make contact with the fear troglodytes, a literally underground vegetarian subgroup of French rebels. She persuades them to help rescue Rison. The troglodytes attack but are repelled and Clapet, with the unsympathetic tenants, storms Rison's room in an attempt to murder him. After a set of dramatic events and some domestic plumbing shenanigans, Clapet the butcher returns with Rison's knife, the Australian. Lacking the skills to wield it, he kills himself. Cut to Rison and Julie playing music together on the roof of the no peaceful apartment building. The clouds seem to open to finally let the sky appear. The end. That's a good summary. Thank you. Whew. Except was it the end? If the only one they could survive was cannibalism, having removed cannibalism, well, I guess they're happy and we only see the two of them. Maybe, Do they just eat the maybe. other tenants? It's never Not said. to mention that whole building's got so it's much kind of water ambiguous. damage now. That was the part that gave me a lot of anxiety. Who's going to clean <laughs> that up? <laughs> well, I think there are several things. First, with the water damage, the population of snails and frogs going to grow, so they got more to feed upon. Okay. Oh, like that. one thing fixed the other thing. <laughs> and then the, the butcher that. actually had a very large stock of grains hidden in the basement. So maybe they're sharing that or not. <laughs> or maybe they just kept the ad in the newspaper. Do we not think the troglodytes took all the grain? That was part of the bargain, right? Oh, yeah, you're right about that. But did they serve? Yeah. All yeah. except the one survived, to my understanding. There was that one guy that was shot. Mm hmm. Bianca, what was your most favorite and least favorite moment in the movie? Well, okay, so less moments, but more kind of themes or tones, I guess. What I really enjoyed and it kind of caught me by surprise was the incorporation of like music and actions. So at the very beginning, when the landlord was having sex with the woman and you could hear like the springs that were making that rhythmic sound and then it cut over to the wife who was smacking the carpet and then those two started to sync up there was the clown worker who was painting and i really really enjoyed that it was just something i don't want to call it subtle necessarily but it was an unexpected coming together of all these mundane actions and then throughout the film they replayed a couple of things with rhythm to it and it really it really kind of brought everything together and i really enjoyed that Mm -hmm. It brought in elements of both of, of the fantastic of, of all these activities syncing up, but also it, it served to kind of be a real early passive explainer of physical feature in the space that, that, that was really conductive to the rest of the episode, which was these pipes that they had, these sewer pipes going vertically through the building that had an auditory connection for all the rooms so that the butcher could listen to what the recent tenant was doing to decide when to kill them, or so that the one brother of the two manufacturing brothers group could nefariously delude the bourgeois wife into believing that she was going mad and needed to kill her, and that also that she should hate the other brother. So I, I feel like they laid good groundwork for that with, with this, this simple rhythm concept of, of everyone can kind of hear everyone else's business. I like that. The exposition is very efficient in that movie. You got characters coming in and they have mundane discussions or small elements. There's a big attention to details all over the place. Yeah, I was rewatching the, the bit when the postman's coming or with the taxi arriving. They, that's when they explain that the currency now is corn and seeds. 
and there are exchanges about the fact that things are not growing anymore. And um, I was reading a, a little trivia about the amount of attention to details. There's a scene where the middle class worker is repairing a condom. So he's blowing on it and he's patching it. <laughs> That's what that I was. I couldn't understand it was that. Drugs that was he was smuggling, right? Mm-hmm. There's like, oh, they're. <laughs> Uh, of course. He's blowing on it. He's double checking that the condom is still uh-huh. in good well, shape. Hold air. Hold there. That's but the thing uh, is, that condom's got two patches in it. Yep. So there's uh-huh. two times where the condom didn't work, and that guy's got. And there's two kids. Exactly. Oh, that's so funny. Huh. <laughs> I didn't put that together. <laughs> I, like I didn't that. either. I read about it, but it got stuff like he, the main character, loses his main shoe, so he had his to use his performance clown shoes, which is is wearing all mm-hmm. day. And uh, as you said, the the whole piping and things there are bits of elements and bits of newspaper which foreshadow the troglodytes and and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So Scott, what was your favorite moment? Probably the filling up of the bathroom in this climactic scene of now we're trapped in a room with no exits, so we're we're going to make an exit by first of all stripping our clothes off, which leads you to awkward. Uh, wh- where are we going with this? But but then just damming up the room and filling the whole thing with water. That also kind of blended elements of the fantastical as to the floor only broke out of that room after they emptied it out of water, not before, which was incredible. But uh, it also really nicely linked up all the consistent mentions of pipes that they've had, the consistent mentions of water that they've had. This. Yeah, this this kind of uh, water-based traveling and and the the verticality that they had through the very vertical building and then uh, the the sewers below they they managed to go down a floor so that was I think that nicely blended a lot of concepts that they've already introduced in the film and right at the climax plus the I guess the the boomerang knife which came up right at the end of that too satisfying that part was <laughs> mm-hmm. well, it's also linked up with the fact that you see the damp ceiling earlier so he's been already fixing the oh, ceiling when he was painting yeah that's right he he painted the, of course didn't that crush you that there's a leaky ceiling and so you paint the ceiling <laughs> you don't you don't go up and paint the you're just like oh there's it. so much mold in that floor why did <laughs> yeah okay Patching but you, you got a problem point. yeah <laughs> I think my favorite, if I had one scene, just one performance, which I thought was completely hilarious, was Jean-Claude Dreyfus, who plays the butcher. And he's got that scene with the old mother-in-law, the grandmother, and he's in the stairs. So he's supposed to kill her, but he's also expecting her to scream and that Luison the clown will show up and he will kill him at the same time. And at first, she's not screaming at all. And he just makes these weird faces in close-up in the camera with a, a big evil smile, which I thought was just, uh, just, just so awesome. For the little story, uh, to add a, a bit of layer of, um, French pop culture, this actor, Jean-Claude Reff, is playing the butcher who's serving people to cannibals. One of his main sources of income following that movie is been having a recurring role in advertisement, playing a character called Monsieur Marie, who was the representative of a brand of ready-made dishes. <laughs> <laughs> Most people never made the connection. Oh, it doesn't really nice. make you want to buy it. <laughs> so Monsieur Marie, uh, for the, the French listeners out there, any low point in the movie? The kids that were smoking. What the heck? <laughs> it did a great job of really establishing, like, these people are poor, like, this environment isn't healthy. So what does it matter if children smoke? But, like, what the heck? Well, it's uh, French uh, kids, you know, uh, they smoke a cigarette. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I was disappointed at the gender bias of violence, where men were killed outright and... Women were subjects of physical violence, but not death. And, and, and that, that distinction disappointed me. Yeah, I, I was a bit... It's interesting. We, we've been reviewing several movies now for film studies and f- movies which are a bit old. And I'm surprised by the... It's not necessarily big things, but the number of small things which I find wouldn't... Are dated. ...be in a movie nowadays in terms of gender bias. Yeah, it's just regular sexism and a uh, mm-hmm. little thing about uh, sexuality uh, and things. Yeah, right. Mm. Yeah, well. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's not my first language. 
<laughs> All good. Um, no, that really does kind of key into like a lot of the women, they were only really used. They were more passive characters. I really enjoyed um, Julie, that she had a bit more of an active role in kind of resolving everything where she went to go hunt out the Trogdolites. But all the other women were just kind of there to show, like the housewoman um, was just there to show you a housewife. Aurora, she was probably my favorite character just because she thought she was crazy. And I thought that was interesting because the world is already crazy. And here we're still seeing a woman that can be even crazier than that. That's interesting. That was kind of my takeaway because her role otherwise was pretty minuscule at the exception of the very end where all of her plans kind of came together accidentally and the room blew up. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny at the same time because I told, uh, I don't remember the name of her character. I wanted to not to, to call her a prostitute in, uh, in the... No, you did a very good job uh, at the beginning of this of not doing so. Uh, yeah, well, sorry. Uh, what's the name of that character? I don't remember her name either. Let me just check that. I will say, as an aside, I read a, a wonderful observation on great movies that, that you forget the characters' names, and then you forget dialogue, but the thing that sticks with you is visuals. You can describe key... Uh, somebody on Twitter said that, that great films can be muted and paused, and you can still get this visceral frame of, of a movie. And I... Uh, while we're looking stuff up anyway, I will mention that, that I feel like this movie had many scenes that I could, I could see muted and paused, just, you know, like traveling through very small pipes and then the very big pipes in the basement. I thought those were visually interesting. They chose interesting camera angles up and down the stairs. They really got a lot of use out of that. Mm -hmm. In Vercality, even with the ladder, I, I feel like they did a lot of, uh, good emotional glimpses into just freeze frame visuals and even up to including children smoking because you could yes. freeze frame that and that would still be a what? And it tells you, like, oh, shit, that world's not great. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a visually very rich movie. I mean, it, in terms of, I think, composing a frame, you, it's up there with uh, the Kubrick and the uh, Wes Anderson, uh, you know, and the work with colors, elements. Again, I was reading trivia today. The movie they made after that is City of Lost Children, which is slightly more uh, famous. Uh, they wanted to make City of Lost Children first, but they couldn't because they were not trusted with the budget, etc. And they made this one with a very tight budget. And most of the things you see in the movie are scavenged stuff. Huh. So there's stuff they found in, uh, yeah, thrift shop and stuff like that. And it gives a, such a down to earth and apocalyptic feel, yet at the same time, this very strong style with, I don't know, sweaters and stuff like that, which yeah, it's got this old France kind of thing. And, uh, yeah, I, I just, I just find it, it's very fascinating. And also I was, I didn't see that movie for a while and I was surprised by the number of items, which you find again in their later movies, like the most famous is probably Amelie. And there, there's a lot of things which you, you find again, which are metal boxes and shoes and, and different elements with that. So I found the name of that character, Mademoiselle Plus, uh, which I don't remember being mentioned in the movie at all. They might not have mentioned her because she wasn't meant to be important. She was just like a passive lover. Was she? Because she actually she's the the one saving the day in the end because she's the one handing the the Australian to uh, the butcher. Oh, d did she do that wittingly? Of course she did. She knows that it's a boomerang knife, and he's never seen. She's it the used. only one who's seen it, so she's the hero of the movie. Hmm. Mm -hmm. When uh, what's his name first uses the boomerang, he mentions like it's not the weapon; it's who handles it. I think was how it was translated, yeah. and I like that because that's that butcher can't handle anything. Mm -hmm. The moment which made me the the most uncomfortable was with her and the troglodytes. I thought it was a bit unnecessary that she was uh, restrained. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Why, why, why they bothered to? A lot of the illustrations of the troglodytes were weird. They seem to be depicted as violent and intimidating, but for no reason. I don't know that, that served much. It, it didn't underscore much mm -hmm. into their characters. It, it just uh, gave them an opportunity to kind of hate on women. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I guess it, they're trying to depict them like they don't want them to be just... Just friendly. The, the good guys you would go find and they're the resistance and the great. They're just as bad and weird as the others in their ways, I guess, and... That's sort of the easy go-to to say someone is, is it's, a villain. It's by is victimizing some, someone else. Some, yeah, and that that's something we had uh, with Brotherhood of, of the Wolf in a way more, uh, even much 
tasteless you know, I, way. I, but, I, I um, think uh, when I'm running my villains, I will stick to introducing a villain by having them execute a low-level agent of their own organization. Oh, nice. Nice. That's a good one. <laughs> I like it. It's classic. It works. I think like force choking a stormtrooper to really underscore who the bad guy yep. is, right? And, you know, the stormtroopers already opted in. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't really sign up for it, but... <laughs> they, I mean, during the Clone War eras, you're right. They were that's, born into it. Yeah. And that's that's really dark. Uh, after that, I think uh, there were volunteers, but we're getting out. <laughs> we will keep that for <laughs> film studies about Star Wars. So, <laughs> Bianca, would that be a movie you would recommend specifically to tabletop RPG fans? I would have to get a feel for the people that I'm going to recommend it to. Do they like children smoking, for instance? Exactly. <laughs> Do they like to see the victimization of women? Like, uh... All in all, though, like, because I really enjoyed it, I think as a table, like, would I recommend it to somebody who plays tabletop games? I think so, like, in passing, but it wouldn't be something I would really insist on, because I think the environment has a lot of potential when the film is first introduced and there's that smog over everything that really it sets a nice scene that this place is just gross there's nothing growing that i really like like obviously there's no bees there's no agriculture as an entire universe that could create something really interesting mm -hmm. different and unique and i like that possibility yeah as as, as far as a post-apocalypse i love that they never dwelled on it and they never talked about how it was trying to be solved they were just they just established some basic facts of of not what caused this dust bowl, but the fact they were living there. They, they just established that as fact and moved on and people were trying to survive. Yep. Simple. It also made me really want to someday correct that horrible D&D &D gaming era where you either inherit a group or something if, if they have like way too much treasure. You just like so, somehow they've, they've been given ridiculous amounts of gold and they have lords and then you say, okay, well, uh, fast forward a year. Now there's a dust bowl and currency is now grain. <laughs> All that gold you guys got is really not doing you any good now, is it? I like that. Okay. So, Scott, <laughs> you would recommend that movie to tabletop RPG fan as a way to foreshadow what's going to happen to them in your D&D &D session? <laughs> uh, possibly. There's going to be a lot of pipes and a lot of water and a lot of in-party murder, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> no. Um... I think I'd recommend it mostly for the visuals. I think it's a visually appealing film. I think like all their films, I'm really glad that you mentioned other films they've made because I really liked Amelie and City Lost Children is my favorite film of all time. And I'd never seen nor heard of this movie and I didn't know that the same directors directed all three. I had no idea. So that's fantastic to know. And the really the common thread is, is these impactful visual scenes. And I feel like, you know, one of the first and most important ingredients in to be able to describe a scene in a visceral way that people can understand is to be able to visualize it yourself, to be able to create this interesting vision in your head. The second thing is describing it in a succinct and effective way, which I'm still rubbish at. But, uh, you know, watching these kind of movies gets me ideas for a way to paint a picture for players. That's fun. To be honest, when uh, I picked that movie, it was a bit of a stretch in terms of I wasn't sure we would have tabletop RPG subjects to discuss. We more of that in a few moments, but I thought it was a great movie for tabletop RPG fans just for the idea of describing a, a fantasy setting which at the same time is very original and low fantasy but very quirky and different from what you are used to show. Yeah, I just like movies like that which shows you that Movies and stories can be very different than the tropes and standards you are used to in most movie stories, uh, etc. So that, that's my main reason why I would recommend it to tabletop RPG fans. And as I was saying, I thought we would not have a lot of lessons to take from that movie. But then Scott showed up on my Google Doc and put a long list of stuff to discuss. So without further ado, let's move in into the potential lessons of Delicatessen for tabletop RPG. So tell me, Scott, you're free to pick in those one, two, three, four, five, seven green <laughs> points, which got several points. What do you think are applications of the teams and ideas of Delicatessen to tabletop RPG? I, I think that we've covered on a fair amount of them. One that I mentioned that probably may or may not be on this list is something that I often forget about. It's, again, we go back to, to painting a scene picture, to describing an environment. And uh, advice I've read a few times, but I've never uh, effectively implemented is, you know, if, if you're designing a whole dungeon or, or an entire session and you want it to have kind of a, a theme or a feel or a vibe, some common visual threads going through it, much like a, an entire cohesive film, one way to get that is is to 
write down for yourself some common visual elements, some common colors, and then use those as, as you know, pick three or four that, that that apply to every scene and write those down for yourself as a little card or a reminder. So when you're describing the scene, you're like, oh yeah, this is this is green and it's dark and there are pillars, right? And then the next one uh, is green and there's pillars, but there's a lot of light, right? So you, you can kind of describe the visual space using this common language that then uh, paints a common picture rather than uh, every tavern looking the same and then every town looking the same. Maybe uh, the elements of this dungeon in this area kind of come out in the, the city and also exist in the flora and fauna, right? There are some common themes. So I, I think for that effect, I, I think it's it's good practice. This the movie is a good example. It's great because I can use you to segue into the question which was supposed to be before this one, which was about which tabletop RPG we could use to play something like Delicatessen. And what you're describing is very close to the only idea I had so far about what tabletop RPG I could use to do something even remotely close to Delicatessen. And that's a game we trial together. It's fantasy universal role-playing game by Anthropos. Pretty much the system is based on the idea of having those cards. Your characters are cards with keywords and traits. The scenes got keywords and traits. The places got keywords and traits. And players are encouraged to use them to get bonuses in the scene so they come back. Yeah, you know, if, if you want to loop in your players to describing things that involve pipes, right? And maybe pipes is one of those theme cards, like you said, in, in Fantasy, And then or fantasy, I, the pronunciation stuff. Um, and then they get bonuses for looping in these these visual elements that, that you're all kind of weaving together into into their character too. That's that's fun. It's something very tough I find with other game system to bring back those elements continually and those themes and uh -huh. strobes to feed in things. What's your view on that, Bianca? Do you both GM and as a player trying to do that with your character or stories? Hmm. Do I? I think to a point, I think it is really important to have a reoccurring theme because that does set the tone for the universe where these players are established now. I don't think it's something I do really actively, maybe passively, like reoccurring things that really like we'd kind of previously discussed. It's what makes people remember stuff, um, just kind of like reoccurring colors, reoccurring I don't want to say monsters, but maybe like certain aspects about a town, certain aspects about a dungeon. Mm -hmm. I don't have a whole lot of experience in this. And to kind of throw back to the previous question where what game would be good to adapt um, with this film? And I was kind of thinking Monster of the Week, right? I feel like it would just... Yes. It, it, yes. I've, I've only listened to yes. a podcast about Monster of the Week. I haven't played it yet. And just from what I've heard, I feel like it would work really, really well. Cause like it's, it is an apocalyptic world and having creatures and having just unfortunate things happen to you based off mm -hmm. of your roles would be excellent in this environment. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. This is the kind of environment where you want things to go both bad and good for the characters, right? It's, you're, you're, you're the point is to weave an interesting story, not to succeed at all costs and yeah, not to, that's not to fun. murder things and collect stuff, right? That's, that's not what the, a game with this theme would have in it. So you're absolutely right that, uh, Monster of the Week, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of romantic drama, right? A little bit of awkward social situations, a little bit of people getting murdered or eaten yep, in the absolutely. background. That's very Monster of the Week. Makes for a good theme. <laughs> it seems appropriate because I was trying to think like, oh, it's a bit like a slasher. So maybe you could use Dread. But Dread is too much of a down slope. Yeah, everyone's going to die in Dread. Yeah, oh. so that it wouldn't quite fit with this movie. I don't see how you would encourage the sort of side scenes and little emotional moments that you have mm -hmm. in Delicatessen with something like Dread because you would actually cut the mood quite a bit. But yeah, Monster of the Week. That, I would be curious to try that. I think it'd be cool. I got a copy of Monster of the Week and I've been meaning to read it and meaning to play it. So who knows? Now I know what I can throw in there. Like it. Oh, that would be so cool. That Keep us posted if you do try uh, Heck yeah. to adapt Delicatessen in some fashion. Any other games you think, or should we remove back uh, forward to uh, <laughs> the applications and teams? I think after that, I'm I'm ready to segue back into um, yes, pulling out more specific ideas into your existing RPG. Mm, ways of escaping a locked room. <laughs> that is interesting. Okay, I have a really random question about the film. Okay, if you were to actually put a bunch of clothes in the cracks and like stop any cracks, like with clothing, would that really? Would that really work? Wouldn't it just leak through like continuously? 
I, I feel like maybe it might stop. It might leak through much more slowly than it's it's your if you fill the room faster than you're emptying the room. Right. Good old calculus tells us that uh, the room will fill. OK, because it seemed like an extreme hyperbole and I wasn't sure because like mm-hmm. visually and like mm-hmm. story wise, it was excellent. But like the realism, I was kind of like, ah, I feel like you've done a great job with everything except. Mm, yeah, it's elements. Yeah. Elements of the fantastic again. Well, one thing I, I remember very distinctly about that scene is they, they were also damming up holes in the top, right? Uh, like like small holes or vents. And so I was wondering if, if the goal was to overpressurize the room because the air couldn't escape too. And and so you, you'd have the increasing volume of water and then you'd have this high air pressure and blow the room like out of the top. No. <laughs> that did not happen. I was a little disappointed. That was maybe a little bit much, but uh, there we go. But uh, as for uh, a way of escaping a locked room, filling it with water and or air and or something until it explodes outward sounds hilarious. It's creative. I would never have thought of that. So <laughs> I just got the vision now. Uh, we're going to go back to Star Wars, but a bunch of some troopers <laughs> opening a locked <laughs> door. And there's just the corpses of four rock Drowned? rebels. <laughs> drawn <laughs> sleeping by them and they're like wow I didn't see that coming also running that risk yeah that's, yep. <laughs> yeah. that's a very uh, dungeon crawls classics like a funnel <laughs> kind of situation right you start with four level zero characters and we're gonna grind you down to one with a funny thing and so some of you get stuck in traps where you think the only way out is to we'll fill the, the pit with water and then we'll be able to float to the top oh no this liquid is Less dense yep. than you are, so you don't float. <laughs> <laughs> you just drown. Yep. Mm. <laughs> no, the the, the gravity uh, breaks down and uh, because it's wet with the water, so you are in a zero gravity environment in a bubble of water, <laughs> floating, and you drown. So the that's, so that's yeah, the some super open the the lock door and they, they just see the bubble floating with the drone characters in the middle. <laughs> So that was a very grim <laughs> application. <laughs> a little bit. The one I really, really liked, and you already mentioned it actually earlier, is this idea of having a setting, an environment, a story, something big things happening all over the world. It can be a zombie invasion, it can be a big war or something like that. And you tell a little story in that. That's... Sorry, going back to Star Wars. That's what I enjoyed to some extent with Star Wars, or even what well, that's what I like with Mad Max Fury Road and or, or the yes. movies is you're not being told mm-hmm. you're not going to save the world today. Uh, you you're just trying to mm-hmm. to cope, to manage, to survive, <laughs> or do your thing in your little corner of the world. Yep. And then there's always elements which are shown and which makes the story richer thanks to, to what you're telling about the newspaper. You read the newspaper and uh, London has fallen today, but you, mm. you're not in London. You are, you're in the middle of France or you're, you're somewhere else in England, B- but it's part of the pressure and the foreshadowing of stuff which can happen and the explanation for what's happening mm-hmm. to you. But you are not going to stop that. Uh, there's no way. Yeah, you're telling a human scale story, right? You you are not uh, Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman. <laughs> you are the C team heroes, right? When the global catastrophe happens and the A team heroes go off to save the world into space or something, and the B team heroes go off to monitor the evil agencies to make sure they're not taking advantage of it. The C team heroes are like crowd control, right? To keep people out of the way of falling buildings or plummeting <laughs> like gigantic robots, right? That's it's that that's a very human level. Uh, it's, and that's a fun tier to play on. I like that. It's easier to empathize with, too, because they're people and they have pe- like human reactions and human understanding for the most part. It reminds me of, of we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, different uh, movies. And it reminds me of uh, Mystery Men, where, uh, you know, the, the shoveler, his character was, was telling his wife, he's like, I've been given a gift. I shovel well. I shovel very well. And she's like, oh, honey, you shovel amazing, right? Like... Like that's that is your power, and he's you know he says to to get some time off tending the kids to go out to do his superhero thing. Like it's it's a human level of of game. The same as is uh, this was like a locked room mystery. This was an encapsulated space of all all they did was the four or five stories of this apartment building, this one building on a completely obliterated block. They didn't like wander the desert at all. They just stayed there, and then a little in the sewers. That was I like it. it. It's a bubble universe. It's, it's like a dungeon, but it doesn't have to be about murder. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Despite all the murders. It's funny you mentioned Batman because even characters like Batman or James Bond, I sometimes lament 
I mean, one of my favorite James Bond movie is Casino Royale because he's there to make sure that the accountant of terrorists loses all his money and that's it. It's true. And that's it. So you can get information and that's it. And it's very tiny. And I always think that I would love to see a Batman movie with a somewhat low budget and would be just one night in the life of Batman. Like someone's got kidnapped and he's got to find them or even not. He's just doing his thing in Gotham. It's just one night with the dark night. <laughs> one and night with he, the- he runs into Gordon. He stops some things over there, but one dark night. instead of some crazy, and then it's gonna, I'm going to go in the professional rant instead of a crazy real estate plan, because real estate doesn't work like that. Please villains from arrows from their devil on Netflix. If you want to gentrify a place, there's much easier way than to corrupt everybody or try to <laughs> create an earthquake. You know, it's bad, easier where you can, there's arguments whether these methods are evil, but I can tell you, actually, I could be a consultant for you. I know the ways to do these things better, but uh, yeah, that's, that's something else. <laughs> I could be but, a better yeah, villain. <laughs> I get what you're saying. Small stories, small uh, stakes. Yeah, small stakes. Well, small and personal, too. Yeah. Yeah, close to home. Easier to empathize with. You see them more as relatable. Mm-hmm. It's less like the Avengers on this grand scale where it's 100% fantastical. And you're like, yeah, that's cool to look at. But like, I I don't see myself in that situation, in, those, mm-hmm. like, in that environment. It just doesn't make any sense. But when you scale it down, all of a sudden it becomes human. You can picture yourself in those situations. And then that kind of translates into when you want to run a game. It becomes that much more doable. You know, at the same time, I, I do love big epic stories. I did enjoy Infinity War, but the problem is when all your movies and all your stories are big stakes all the time and that... And then you just have to keep upping the stakes. You know, I, I've worked with many DMs, GMs who exhaust themselves. The, half the reason the campaign ends is because every time they obliterate something, right? You're in a town. Well, I'll obliterate the town, right? And then you're in this country. Well, I'm going to obliterate the country, right? And, and you, <laughs> you you can only take, play that one-upsmanship game so much until the stakes are absurdly high. We mentioned that it was like a dungeon, an enclosed space, just a few floors. I was wondering, do you remember what would have been, in your experience, the smallest kind of sandbox or environment you play the role-playing game into? I don't really do anything too small or localized. Everything's kind of got this big world involved, so you have all of that room and area to explore. Yeah. I tried that recently. It was not that small. It was not a single building. I actually played some games where it was a single ship, official campaign for Star Wars by West End Games called Dark Strider. I guess the, the comparison you could make to it is something like Battlestar Galactica. In the way it was run, I was a player, could be the show Oz by HBO, which is in, in jail. It's a very contained environment, but at the same time, you, you end up going into really the minutiae of everybody being in that place. I mean, if you're in a big city or in a big country in Dungeons and Dragons, usually you interact with a few NPC were dotted around the map. There it would be just the end of the corner. So in the end, you will interact with as many NPCs, but everything is very packed and condensed and very dense like that. Yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm reminded vaguely of uh, some people's interpretation of Barovia, you know, the, the good old-fashioned uh, vampire uh, setting for Dungeons & Dragons. It's it's actually quite contained in a way, yeah. Yeah, and, and in fact, very forcibly. You, you are not allowed to explore outside of this small town in this castle where there's a vampire. Like, you will be eaten by a Gru if you attempt to leave. And there is a horrible, <laughs> monstrous fog that keeps you in here. That's sort of the hook, right? Is is huh. uh, wherever you are in your campaign, you, you can be brought to Barovia uh, through a horrible fog. And then you're just stuck here in this horror environment until you can get out. I like the potential that it offers. I've never had the opportunity to experience anything like that. It seems interesting. Yeah. Um, So, yeah. But but I, you know, I've never done anything really micro contained. I mean, maybe for one session, right? Where where there's there's a mystery and it's a locker room mystery. There was uh, one session of Lawful and Orderly that took place entirely on a ferry. And it was two hours and it was a long ferry across the river, right? And so the entire session was this ferry ride. And that was similar, but that was just one session. We we still got, you know, it was a big ferry. Still plenty to do. But there's always... Plenty to do. I guess 
delicatessen again is very extreme. You got one single building. When you but when you think of it, you got just enough NPCs that in a regular game of role playing game you would interact with. Mm -hmm. Barovia is a good. I it's actually interesting because I'm remembering reading Curse of Strat. I haven't played or mastered it yet, but the castle itself is quite detailed and there's a lot of room and a lot of secondary stuff. I mean, it, it's got a feel of Castlevania. <laughs> you know, you, you mm -hmm. got back doors and stuff like that. So you could actually do a lot being stuck just in the castle mm -hmm. and probably making a, a few levels of progress before you face Strad himself. Yeah, definitely. I would say that making unlikely alliances to defeat your foes, I, I really enjoyed that. I mean, despite the fact that they portrayed sort of the underground rebels kind of an iffy manner. I never really got a good uh, vibe for them, and, and I wasn't I wasn't uh, thrilled with that. But uh, I did like the idea of maybe the enemy of my enemy is my friend, or uh, sort of there are other resources and I, I can explore the use of those. Right, so I I could see bringing that concept into a game too. That's always my favorite: the unexpected allies or the you know enemy of my enemy is my friend because they're always the coolest ally friend of me to have. Yep. Yep. You, so. you, you know the alliance won't last forever. The dramatic question is when will it break, not will it? Yes, and it's always interesting. It's one of my favorite themes to use. It's funny you mentioned that just after we discussed of the, the tiny sandbox, and I, I just only realized now that the person solving that, Julie, when she does that, she's the only one actually leaving the building. Mm -hmm. So that's the only moment where you have someone leaving to do something else so she's literally thinking out of the sandbox outside of the box she's thinking outside of the box <laughs> literally and she mm. gets <laughs> other npcs in to actually solve a solution so not just the mailman or the taxi driver wow mm. <laughs> the characters are unlikably likable <laughs> <laughs> like that sums up a lot of my feelings about all of them i thought it was a charming, sweet, brutal, cannibal society. <laughs> so French, you know what I mean? They, 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 they already <laughs> hit horses. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just happy that I didn't have a happy ending. Not what I would consider a happy ending. I hate like beginning middles and just like a happy conclusion. I like when it's like vague and there's a lot of ambiguity. It makes me feel a little bit better about it because nothing ever gets tied up nicely in a bow. So this mm. kind of maintained that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how those characters, you don't know where they were born, you don't necessarily know what's their exact job, etc. But at the same time, there are loads of details about their life and what they do and what's their opinion. They're very tropey and at the same time, they're very subtle. So you, you, again, you, you clearly have a middle class worker <laughs> with his kids and wife and mother-in-law. You've got the sort of bourgeoisie who are, who are not very concerned by the problems, but at the same time, they cannot be completely disconnected. Apparently, they still have wealth somehow, so they, they don't yeah, right. they don't worry so much about that. But at the same time, they you've got this poor woman depressed to the to the point of uh, of being suicidal, and at the same time, they she and they, they all interact with each other. She interacts with the, the brothers in two ways. The one is in love with her. The other is torturing her. You got this weird manufacturer. So, so really, you, you have a lot of... They've managed to make a lot of characters very deep using very small brushstrokes. Like, like a few broad yes. strokes, and they've created a lot of depth into a character. And so is what you're getting at. The puzzle, then, is for us to understand how they did that and incorporate that into our NPCs that... I can paint with a few broad brushstrokes and end up with this bourgeoisie woman who is wealthy and kept, but also suicidal and, and has complicated feelings about the, one of the brothers from downstairs and is also ineffective at, at her suicide. And, and uh, <laughs> Seriously, my favorite. Just like the parody on suicide and just like, regardless of all the efforts that you're making, she just doesn't succeed. And part of my favorite, I don't know, it was just, mm -hmm. it was a weird combination of events and I, I really enjoyed it her consistent choices to require circumstances to construe her death, right? Rather than, than her directly participating, she would just set up a situation for this. And, and then, I'll, yeah, that, that, that killed me. 
I almost want to say, like, I, I know, like, the whole idea is that it is, like, a dark comedy, so this is, like, a parody on trying to be suicidal, but I almost feel like that, because she was, she's not actually what we're calling crazy. She was just being spoken to consistently to assume that this is, like, the voices in my head are telling me to do this. Mm -hmm. So I want to say, like, my interpretation is the rational side of her brain was crafting these elaborate ways to kill herself because, like, you deep down she might not actually want to so the more complicated the more room for error but it was on a subconscious level interesting she's a willy coyote of suicide <laughs> that's <yeah>. yes <laughs> but I, I, I enjoyed them i thought she made sense because at the same time i mean the circumstances of all these characters is horrible i mean <laughs> you would have more than one yeah. reason to to want yeah. to to end your life in, in such yeah, conditions nobody there is happy except those two kids and every time they pan away to them doing yeah. something, it was great and delightful and ridiculous. And then they pan back. Always, yeah. <laughs> the thing I thought with the bourgeois, suicidal bourgeoise is that, in a way, it's because she's wealthy and she can afford to be, you know, to have those feelings because the others are just too busy, tr just trying to survive. Oh yeah, yep. and yep. being hungry. And doing their things, you know, the, on the daily life, the grind that her, she's like, she can, she's got the luxury of actually looking at everything around the, her and the see how too. bad things are. Mm -hmm. So I thought it actually made some sense. I like that. In terms of, of characters with a, a few brushstrokes, they, they can be very, they got a whole concept going on. I really love the legionnaire in the basement was the only one. <laughs> Not eating the meat because he's strictly feeding on snails and he, he lives with the frogs and the the zenith of that character is when he, he I don't know what you call those things from um uh New Year's Eve which you, you blow at parties. Mm, yeah, Streamers? The, the, yeah, party poppers? No. Party poppers? Not, neither of those. No. Whatever. Those we... things you blow at New Year's Eve parties. Yeah. And they get straight, you know, you put them in your mouth, they they're curly and they they get straight and you see him you don't get what is going for that moment so he's surrounded by frogs all the time and he puts on this weird goggles which grows his eyes and he takes these things which is apparently dipped in glue and he uses it to catch fly and then he eats it because his whole concept is that he's turned into a kind of human frog yeah. I, I just love this one and uh, yeah a lot of interesting themes a lot of interesting characters that were created to be lesser characters but we didn't like they, that didn't stop them from being interesting even the main villain uh, was I mean, he's got a daughter he loves her he wants to protect her but it's yeah, yeah it's, it's bad and weird but I love how he tells to people uh, people are saying yeah, they, they don't know where things gonna start growing back again and he's like nothing's gonna grow back uh, get that in your head he's got things sorted and he wants people actually to sort themselves uh, in a way I guess but uh, yeah yeah wow <laughs> I loved uh, that movie. All right. So I guess it's time for the sign-off. Uh, this is a show from the RPG Academy Network. We are doing it out of a passion for the hobby, but we do have expense. So please consider heading to our Patreon. There's a lot of good bonuses there. And you can also join us on Discord, which is quite nice. You got all the show hosts, including Bianca, Scott, and many others. Bianca. Can you plug again yourself and your show, please? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so my name is Bianca Zelda. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram. I am a member in the Broadswords. My character's name is May Pri. If you're also a really big fan of us, we have a Discord group that we would love for you guys to join. I've heard this is a very popular show in the offices of Wizards of the Coast. Uh, some people... <sighs> I'm obviously I'm not very good at plugging myself. Um, yes. So our DM Victoria got like an in and basically she got the authority to put together podcast to foes, which is 20 odd podcast groups got an advanced copy of, I'm going to butcher the name, Morde Mordenkainen, Mordekainen, <laughs> really hard for me to pronounce, Tome of Foes, nice D&D &D book, um, looks really good. And so we got the advanced copy, so we got to do a nice one-shot episode where we incorporated a little bit of the lore, uh, some of the monsters, and we got to fight that out. And it was a lot of fun. Nobody died, thankfully. It was really close. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like Wizards of the Coast, they really like us, so we're, we're getting there. We're getting big. Congratulations. Thanks. Scott, I think Lawful and Orderly did one of those uh, podcasts of foes things. 
Yes, we were honored to be included as the Aww. least popular podcast among those 20, <laughs> and we were charmed and delighted to be on the list. Very kind thanks to Victoria and all y'all for putting that together. So you can find our podcast, The Foes Episode, also on the D&D stream where it is, and we'll put it up on our stream as well. You can find us at dndsvu.rpg.academy or at dndsvu on Twitter. And uh, Laughlin Early streams Monday nights. We're about to stream right now, actually, after I get off this recording. So uh, I'm going to go have some fun. And if y'all want to listen, it's fun on the bun, too. Not as fun as Broad <laughs> Swords, but fun. pretty close. <laughs> I'm sure. There we go. Very different fun. Uh, yep. So uh, that's that's all I've got. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And uh, come on back to the Academy. No, that's a terrible sign off. I'm just. <clears throat> it's fine. Ooh. That was a little creepy. Please join us. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> Fine. We'll allow okay. it. As a reminder, Film Studies is a cross-network project. The concept is the following. If you are, well, it's for show hosts of any show of the RPG Academy, they just volunteer to run, produce one episode, and in exchange, they can pick the movie. So I was Kalum from the Rollist podcast. I picked Delicatessen. The Rollist Podcast is a Rollist that's French for role player. It's complicated to spell, so I won't spell it again. Just check out the description of this episode and I will make sure there's a link for you in there. And the Rollist Podcast is your London based, yes, London, there's a lot of French speakers there, London based show of tabletop RPG fans across the channel, the pond, and beyond. And thank you for listening to this episode of RPG Academy film studies yes i was about to forget actually so this is episode four episode five we'll see again a member of the broadswords team as victoria volunteered to host the next episode it's going to be about high spirits a movie of which i forgot the date and there's a gentleman the main actor who's been part of my childhood as the main actor from police academy but neither myself nor scott managed to remember that person's name although he was very popular back in the 80s that's the way things sometimes you're on top and then and then people just forget the name they remember you but they forget your name thank you very much and uh, see you for next episode of the RPG Academy Film Studies dedicated to high spirits and just your comments if you have some and that's it goodbye thanks everybody bye